Okay, so today we are going to be looking at a bubble sort. So it's one of three sorts that you need to know for the OCR J277 specification. And we'll have a look at it over the course of this session. First of all, quick starter. Uh, what I want you to do is match the images or try and make a word from the images. So you've got two words, uh, the first one being the top two images and the second one being the bottom two images. I'll pause and give you a chance. So you've got the uh, binary on the left and then searching, and then you've got a linear, a linear graph, and then linear searching. So the two searching algorithms that we looked at previously. So specification content then, as I mentioned, there are three different types of sorting algorithms that we're gonna look at, bubble, merge, and insertion. And in today's session, we're gonna be looking at the bubble sort, but it's worthwhile just kind of being aware that there are two other methods as well. The requirements, again, exactly the same as they were with our uh, searching algorithms, and these will be the same for the other sorting algorithms as well. So first of all, let's just establish what we mean by the term sorting. Now, sorting is, in essence, to organise something. Now, this could be organising in ascending or descending order, and this could be either through a numerical value or alphabetical. So it's worthwhile commenting that you can sort things in a number order, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, for example, or A, B, C, D, E, F, G, so, so forth for the alphabet. And we can do that going from smallest to largest or largest to smallest, depending on the criteria set out by our algorithms. And ultimately, it's just that idea that we're organizing the data in a um, sorted manner. Now, we do this so that it makes it easier for us to search for data. So if you think back to our previous sort of lesson where we were talking about binary and linear searches and how a binary search is far more efficient. The, the prerequisite for a binary search to take place is that the data has to be in order for that to take uh, to actually carry out. So this sorting process puts the data in order for us to then uh, use a binary search, for example. Now, obviously, there's questions to raise over whether or not it's efficient to do a sort and then a search or just to stick with a linear search. But that's a conversation for another day. So bubble sort then. So bubble sort is one of the most simple sorting algorithms to understand. It's probably the easiest as well to actually implement. So this comes to when you're actually coding it, it's probably the easiest to code of all of the uh, sorting algorithms that we're going to be looking at. And a bubble sort works by comparing two numbers at a time in a list to establish which of the two numbers is the greatest. And we'll look at an example of this. So what we've got here is a simple list. 3, 1, 4, 2. And you can see as humans that that's out of order, and it would probably take us a matter of seconds to simply put those numbers in order. Now, obviously, this changes when we start to work with much larger data sets. So if we were working, for example, a list of a thousand numbers, it might take us a bit longer to arrange this data, whereas a computer may well be quicker at that time. So we're going to just use this to kind of demonstrate the process and the example of how a bubble sort works. So we'll take the list of 3, 1, 4, 2 as our unsorted list. The first thing we do is take the first two numbers. So in this case, three and one, and we make a comparison. We check to see if three is greater than one. And if three is greater than one, we swap them. So we've now completed our first swap. We move to the next two numbers. Now notice that the next two numbers are now three and four, because our list has changed. This time we're checking to see is three greater than four. And in this instance, three is not greater than four, and therefore we do not swap those two numbers. We then move along our list again. This time is four greater than two. And you can see that four is greater than two. And therefore, we complete our swap. Now we've reached the end of our list comparing our numbers, but we as humans can see that that list still isn't in a sorted and organized manner. This is pass one. We will go through this list again from the very starting numbers through to the end again, and that will form part of pass two. So again, as we move into pass two, we start just as we did with the first time around. So we look at the first two numbers. This time, one and three. Is one greater than three? No, it's not. Therefore, we don't make a swap. We then move to the next two numbers, three and two. Is three greater than two? Well, yes, three is greater than two, and therefore we swap. Now, you can see at this point that the list is now in order. However, the computer hasn't got the ability to necessarily recognize that that's in order and so we'll continue to check the rest of this list. So we check the final two numbers. Is three greater than four? Well, it's not. And therefore, we don't make any swaps. And this is the a pass two completed. Now, as I mentioned, we have a sorted list at this point, and we know as humans that we can see that quite simply that is. But if we mention again that if it's a thousand numbers, a million numbers, 
it's not going to be that easy for us to just scan across that to see that it's in order. So the computer needs to do something in order to make sure that, that list is a completely sorted list. And this is, it goes through a final pass. Now this is pass three that is coming up. So pass three, you can see that we go through each of the rows and we make no swaps in the whole of the process. That is the point at which the computer can prove that the list is in order because no further swaps have been made. Now this example has taken three passes. If we had a, a, a bigger list, it's gonna take a greater number of passes. If we had a more uh, jumbled up list, so if the numbers were in a different order, it might take more passes as well. So it's not necessarily a case that it's gonna take three passes every time. But we know that the list is in order when we go through the entirety of the list and no swaps are made. That's the condition that needs to be met for the computer to determine that the list is now in a sorted order. So in essence, your pairs of numbers are compared each time as we work through our list to complete a bubble sort. And this is the algorithm for a bubble sort. So we take the first and second elements from a list, we compare them. If element one is greater than element two, we swap. We repeat with the next two elements until you reach the end of your list. Repeat this process until you've moved through the entire list, making no swaps. It's a reasonably straightforward idea to understand. It does look a bit more complex when we look at it in pseudocode and then in Python, but the idea um, hopefully is relatively straightforward to follow. So here is the pseudocode for a bubble sort. So I'll briefly talk through this, but it may be a case of pausing and reading the comments to help you with your understanding. But we've got some initialization of some variables so that we've got our counter, which keeps track of where we are in our list, our swaps true, which will just basically be a value that will be used to see if we've made any swaps in our list, swaps being zero, which will increase every time we make a swap. And then it's important we know the length of our list because that's our sort of maximum value that we're going to get to. I'll pause there and I'll let you read through the comments on this code because it'll take um, a few seconds to go through and that should hopefully help with your understanding of this pseudocode. Remember, this is pseudocode, not Python. Therefore, it's not going to be the exact syntax to write this program. If you want the exact syntax to write this program in Python, here's an example. And this is using the list of numbers one, three, four, and two, just as we did with the example that we worked through in these slides. And you can see in this process, this is in essence that pseudocode from the previous slide converted into Python. And you'll notice that there are some lines that will be there in pseudocode that won't necessarily be there in Python. Things such as end while or end if. Those things don't need to be in Python and therefore are omitted. There are a few things to consider though with a bubble sort. So we've looked at what a bubble sort is, the pseudocode for it, and examples of the code. But we need to consider whether a bubble sort is always gonna be the best option for us. Now bubble sorts are really straightforward to understand, and as I mentioned, relatively easy to implement. They're not very memory intensive. So when you're running a bubble sort, you're only ever really needing to store three values. The two values you're comparing, and then a temporary value which is used when you overwrite with whichever is the greatest. But the thing about bubble sorts is they're really inefficient. Now, you saw with our data set where we had four numbers and it took us three passes to get through that list. The minute we start to work with larger data sets, that complexity grows exponentially. It, grows, it gets significantly more time consuming. And if you wanted to test that theory, you could just write down 10 numbers, for example, in any order and try and do a bubble sort on them. And you'll find it will take you an awful long time to go through that process. And that's just with 10 numbers without, like we mentioned, a thousand, a million or anything like that. So they're really, really inefficient as we start to work with larger data sets, but it gets the idea and the concept of how computers can sort data uh, across in a nice, easy, manageable way.